I'll ask you to take your scriptures or maybe use the Pew Bible. You'll see the page number there, 856. It is Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 39 through 56. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 39. This is God's word. Let us give careful attention to its reading. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. That ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let us go to him in prayer. O oh Lord, do be pleased now to make these ancient words live afresh by the same spirit who had Luke write them. Come and minister their truth to us now. Write them upon our hearts. Let us have increased faith let us find new grounds of joy and hope. Let us see new avenues of application and obedience to you, our King. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Some of you know already, uh, I really love the Christmas hymns and carols of the church. Uh, I've been known to listen to them at various times of the year. And matter of fact, during our summer backyard fellowship time, uh, we actually used uh, Joy to the World, Isaac Watts' hymn on Psalm 98, there in the, in the middle of the summer. And they come with, to me with such uh, just astounding truth, often in, in poetry. You think of the hymn, um, Hark the Herald, Veiled in Flesh. The Godhead see, hail incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our man. And we've been singing such wonderful things even this morning, inviting that child of Bethlehem, who is Emmanuel, who of course now is no babe any longer, but seated upon the throne of the universe. Come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Such great hymns and truths of hope and joy and truth. So it's a wonderful time of the year for me. And we, we want to be encouraged in that. Well, we're looking in these, this week and in the weeks to come in December, at the hymns that uh, Luke records taking place from the mouth of various people, and we come to Mary's hymn today. 
And as we do so, uh, you know, this gets the fancy Latin term, uh, the Magnificat, from the first word in the Latin translation of this, where she says, my soul magnifies, magnifies the Lord. And that's what this hymn is about. This is what Mary is doing. And it's really a very important point. In other words, this is, this is truly a hymn of praise and thanksgiving that we're going to take a look at today. Sinclair Ferguson, in speaking about the issue of praise, praising God, we could go back to our first catechism question. What is our chief end? To glorify God and to enjoy Him to forever. He makes the statement, he says, A Christian's real development in spiritual life will always be revealed by, by how he or she thinks about God, how much he thinks about Him, and how highly he thinks about Him. For worship is essentially the reverse of sin. Sin began when we succumb to the temptation, you shall be as gods. We make ourselves the center of the universe and dethrone God. By contrast, worship is giving God His true worth. It's acknowledging Him to be the Lord of all things and the Lord of everything in our lives. And so Mary understood that. And hopefully as we consider this text and, uh, and seek to apply it in our own lives, we too will enter this greater state of worshiping God, of placing Him on the throne of our hearts and giving Him the glory that is His due. Because that's what it's about. These, these stories, and when I use that term story, uh, they are historic. They actually happened. Luke is recording them accurately from eyewitness accounts and other reports. But they are not about making uh, Zechariah, for instance, great, or Elizabeth, or even Mary, for that matter. These accounts are recorded, certainly because they are true, but they really are throwing light upon the, upon the Lord Jesus himself. Who is this person that has entered the human race as a baby through the virgin birth of Mary? This is none less than the Lord, that term used for Yahweh in the Old Testament, the great God. And so let's begin. Um, and I want to, uh, uh, I want to talk about... Uh, I'm just going to say two comments because we simply don't have time to, to trace these things. Um, we live in a region where Roman Catholicism still uh, exercises a certain amount of importance and such. And, and if you, most of you know, I, I don't go around bashing and I'm not bashing Roman Catholicism at this point. I only want to say that... Mary in Roman Catholic thought is seen as the mediatrix and as such, they, there's certain language there, an object of veneration, that she is seen as the holiest of creatures, that she was um, conceived with what is termed the immaculate con conception. And I want us to say just briefly what Mary says herself in this him says, no, that's not true about me, because she says in verse 47, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Mary needed a Savior. Mary was a normal uh, woman born of two human parents. She had with her the guilt of Adam's first sin and her own sins, just like you and I have. And so that's all I'm going to say about that, and more could be said. Some of you, uh, I know our brother, uh, um, Elder Chris Popovich, came out of uh, Roman Catholicism and knows this stuff uh, pretty well. And so if you want to talk further about those things, I'll, I'll send you to him. He didn't know I was going to say that today, but... Uh, We'll do that. And the second issue, and this too, very important. We simply are going to go in a different direction today. But this text speaks volumes about 
the correctness, the biblical position of the sanctity of human life within the womb. These, uh, John the Baptist is within Elizabeth's womb at the time of Mary's arrival, and there is life. She says, the baby jumped, the baby moved within me. And of course, Mary carrying the true life of the Lord Jesus. But once again, so uh, keep in mind that, uh, that the scriptures do support the view of this church, the conviction of this church, that life within the womb is sacred. All right, but we're going to move now to what Mary does. She is involved in praise. And we could compare this, and it is often and rightly compared to Hannah's song of praise in 1 Samuel and many of the psalms of praise within the book of Psalms. And uh, we're going to take a look at four kind of movements within this hymn that Mary um, picks up as she goes. And so the first one is... And we are to learn that we are to praise God for His personal dealings with ourselves. His personal dealings with ourselves. That's where Mary starts. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Why, Mary? Why are you doing this? For He has looked upon me, His servant. He has had regard for me. He has blessed me. He's given me this calling, this, this uh, astounding position uh, uh, and role of being the one who would be blessed with carrying the, the mediator, the Messiah, into this world. And so she rightly is responding to God. She didn't earn this. She, it comes to her by grace. But, she, but everything about her, her spirit, it, 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 true praise is, is something that is, is whole personed. She has knowledge. Her mind is engaged. She has emotion. She is rejoicing. My guess is there might have been the raising of hands or, or other movements there as she is praising God. With all of her faculties and resources, she sings from the entire heart and life and depth of her being for the greatness of what God has blessed her with. I think we have to face the fact that we are often distracted by the concerns of this world and, by, and what that leads to is a spiritual amnesia. We often forget. We forget the magnitude, the greatness of what it means to be a child of God. We fail to profit from the Lord's past activity as in our lives. And all of these things have been going on literally for centuries. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses speaks to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And he says that don't, uh, don't forget what you have been given here. You're going to go into a land with homes and fields and things like that. And you're going to be tempted to say, by my great power, I have made all of these things. And Moses is saying, don't forget you were redeemed out of Egypt, and God is the one that has given you this land. And it's often the case that we forget. Every, every Christian is nothing less than a supernatural, it is the result of a supernatural process. We'll say it that way. No one earns it. No one makes themselves that. It is an act of of the living God, and we can rightly put on our lips the words of Mary, He had regard for me. He looked upon me in mercy and grace. He called me. 
He placed me within his son and gave me the blessings and benefits of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Mary is an example of how we should, in our lives regularly, daily, give praise and thanksgiving to God for what he has done in our lives, in my life and in your life. But there's a second thing she does. She, she doesn't just stop there. That would be enough to keep us going. But she, you might say she's looking at what God has done in herself and maybe kind of thinking about herself and the child she's carrying and such as that. But it's like she, she maybe lifts her eyes up and the, the, the theme of her song changes away from herself to God in his essence. And she praises this God and begins to mention many of his attributes. You'll see that in verse uh, in verse 49. For this one is mighty. We spent uh, the recent sermon last, last week talking about how that is revealed. Gabriel comes to her and says nothing will be impossible with God. And now in her song she says, Lord, I'm still praising you not only for what you have done in my life personally, but I'm praising you for your perfections, your attributes. You are the mighty God. She says also here, he is not only the mighty God, but oh, she knows this God to be holy. Holy is his name. The great seraphim flying before God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And she understands that and it's a source of praise to her. Going back to what the quote from Sinclair Ferguson, what, what reveals where we are with our Lord, where we are in our walk with the Lord is certainly partly revealed with the grandeur of the thoughts we have of God himself. And oh, she has great thoughts because it's not just his might, it's not just his holiness, but now she brings in a third trait, a third attribute of God in verse 50, and his mercy. His mercy is for those who fear him. And so, and on it goes, Charles Spurgeon actually has a sermon, he, he calls it the, uh, uh, the ten-stringed lyre musical instrument and he sees 10 attributes of God that Mary brings forward. I won't go through all of them. You can go to Spurgeon sermons and read it yourself. But, uh, but she is enthralled first with what God has done with having regard for her personal dealings with God. But it brings her up to dwell on his his uh, perfect attributes. I highly encourage you. There are, there are books that are out there. A.W. Tozier has written Knowledge of the Holy. A.W. Pink has a, a book on the attributes of God. The classic, the one that by the grace of God in my life, I look back at my life at the University of Alabama coming to know the Lord there right at the time when J.I. Packer wrote his book Knowing God and somebody directed me to that. That book has been a mainstay in my personal Christian life ever since those days. Thinking grand thoughts, trying to get our minds around the greatness of God. Well, that's the second thing that comes out in Mary's song, and, and we, need to, we need to work on those things. Reading those great passages like Isaiah 40, and, and so many that, that draw us up into who our God is that has had regard to us and has saved us. Well, Mary then moves to God's performance in history. So she's praising him for his personal dealings in, his life, in her life. She's praising him 
for who he is, his perfect attributes. And now she's going to praise God for his performance in history, his way of doing things in the earth. There's a general principle that's stated here, and it's repeated through the whole Bible. The principle of God's dealing is God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And it wasn't that long ago that we spoke about that. It was in our, our studies, our sermons from John chapter 13 through 17, from where the Lord humbles himself and washes the disciples' feet. It was in the sermon concerning uh, uh, God and human governments and such. But, so, but just by way of reminder, we want to see what she says here. Salvation and other blessings are not just isolated events, but they're always linked with another element which gives the full picture. And that full element is God's sovereign judgment over the world. If salvation is your deliverance from sin and Satan's kingdom, there are going to be those who re do not experience that, and there is a judgment. There's a principle that's there. And so Mary begins. L look at what she says. Look at the text. She says in verse 51, he's shown strength with his arm. What has he done? He's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. There they are, like Psalm 2 they're taking counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Let us break their chains from us. Let us tear us, tear us under those, those things that would hold us to him. The kings of the earth think they are something. And Mary rightly understands he scattered them abroad, apart. He brings them down the mighty from their thrones. And, and we begin to see Mary knew. One of the things that's just is evident here is Mary knew what we call the Old Testament. She knew it thoroughly, which is one more point of application if we're going to worship and praise God aright to know his word thoroughly. But she knows all these things. We think about, she, she's probably thinking, well, here's the God of the flood. Noah's flood and how he saves some and brings judgment upon others. What about, what about Pharaoh? The people of Israel were there for centuries and, and this evil Pharaoh and he's the greatest king on the face of the earth. He's got him in subject. Oh, they'll never escape. Oh, really? God comes and in ten plagues destroys Pharaoh and sets his people free. And sends them into the Canaanite land and there's Jericho and they march around it and the walls fall. And you know the story. We could talk about Sennacherib coming, uh, the Assyrian king uh, to Hezekiah and Sennacherib's army is destroyed. We can talk about the, the book of Esther where Haman has this wonderful plan. I'm going to kill that Mordecai and Haman ends up hanging on the gallows that he constructed. The Bible is filled with this truth and Mary understands it. This principle of God's performance in history to scatter, to take down those that call themselves mighty, those that think themselves proud, those that think themselves self-sufficient and self-confident and can save myself and take care of myself and I don't need a God and, and on and on their, their comments might be. God will show such, hopefully, hopefully he will show such what he showed me in you. That you're not all that. In fact, you are in desperate need of a Savior. And give you that grace to repent of sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But for those who will not, there is certain destruction. And Mary praises God for that. The last thing she prays, praises God about is not only has he, done personal, has he personally blessed her, not only does he have perfect attributes, not only is his performance in history astounding, but his promises are certain. She ends her hymn of praise saying in verse 54, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy 
as he spoke to our fathers, and she specifically mentions to Abraham and to his offspring forever. She goes back 2,000 years, because that's when Abraham lived, 2,000 years before the birth of the Lord. And she's looking at that and says, my God is a God who when he says something, he does it. When he promises something to his people, he brings it about. And he will always do that. And he will continue to do that forever and ever and ever. What a mighty truth that should evoke praise from us that as we read promise after promise in the scriptures and we read these doctrines and truths that we say yes my God is a truth telling God he never lies he never lets his word fall to the ground without doing what it is to uh, what he plans for it to accomplish Well, where are you right now? Where's your heart? As Brian, our, our elder Brian rightly prayed, it's such a time when we're often distracted. And it's a time, too, when you have life events coming your way. And you may not have come to church today wanting to praise your God. But I hope you can do what Mary does. Whatever your situation that brought you here, whatever concerns that are weighing down on your heart, and we're not going to deny those things, but if you're a child of God, would you do what Mary does? Would you thank God that he has had mercy upon you in Christ? Would you look up? And say, oh, what a mighty God, what a holy God, what, a, what an astounding God I have to worship. Would you look out on the world and see, yes, our God. You know, I read recently, we tend to think that Europe is, is a dead, cold place. There was a meeting through Tim Keller and some others of several hundred church planners. And one of them said, we are on path right now to plant 400 new churches in 40 different cities in Europe in the next five or 10 years. Does that not make you praise God? That the secularism and the, the, the what, whatever the isms are that seem to control European culture and life, they will come crashing down one day. Our God is on the move. Our God is extending his gospel throughout all the world. And then to excite your heart with the truth that God will do he will stand. He does stand behind every promise he's ever made. And as I mentioned already in the sermon, if you're here today, and some of this sounds strange and you don't really know who this Lord Jesus is, if you want to know more about him, please talk with me. For he is the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord. There is no other name given on earth by which a person can be saved than this name, this one who has gone to the cross bearing my guilt and the guilt of all of his people, those that trust in him, and giving them life in his name and a family, taking us into the family of God. Let's pray. Lord, it's a good thing to pull aside on this your day, on this morning, to place behind us the cares, concerns of the world, and to reflect again, to, to think again, to try to feel and, and move toward you, though you are not far from us, you are here, you are revealing yourself in and through your word and in our hearts, to be inspired again, to worship you, to praise you, to thank you 
to love you. That first great commandment, to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Would you do that in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.